some of the key takeaways I want you to make from today's presentation. One is just when to think about consumer products as marketplaces. We know a lot about basic marketplaces and what they are, and a lot of products today are both consumer products and marketplaces at the same time. But sometimes you could take certain concepts, such as market liquidity, uh, which I'll explain, and really use that as a way of framing up your product holistically uh, and using that to balance some of the different needs. Because in a marketplace, you have explicitly at least two different types of users. And so as your product uh, traditionally begins to grow, you can use some marketplace concepts in creative ways to help you balance some of those different needs. Uh, so a little bit about my background uh, and some of the things I've worked on. So I've been a PM for a couple of years now. Uh, I originally started as a product manager at Shopify, which is an e-commerce platform. Um, I transitioned into product when I was there because uh, I started working on this project called like bot prevention. And I'm a big sneakerhead. I don't know if any of you guys here are, but essentially when a big merchant like Kanye West, Kylie Jenner uh, releases a bunch of merchandise, it sells out in like two minutes, and so a lot of people uh, are basically DDoSing the website trying to buy it because there is a lot of profit to be made. So sort of started up a project in preventing that from happening on the platform and got to really work with some cool merchants like uh, Yeezy himself. Uh, I also uh, spent the last couple of years working at Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I started out on the Instagram growth team working on the follows feature, which is if you know what Instagram is, you know how to follow someone. And then uh, spent a good amount of time working on creator monetization at Facebook, uh, where we took uh, a brand new ads product. It is those annoying ads you see on videos, uh, but we scaled it up a lot and grew it from around like 30K per day to over 300K per day in revenue to something that is now over a million dollars in revenue per day. Uh, and just recently, I moved over here from the Bay Area, uh, like literally like three months ago, and I started at a new job uh, doing growth over at Grailed, which is a marketplace focused on fashion, specifically like men's fashion, streetwear, and all of that. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of experience uh, ranging from sort of non-traditional marketplaces, which we'll focus on today in terms of the Facebook and the video example, to sort of like traditional retailer uh, and an actual marketplace now. So let's go just kind of start off with some marketplace basics just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, a marketplace is essentially defined as a platform where it's a many-to-many -many transaction. Uh, whereas a traditional retailer is more of like a one-to-many. And so if you think about a marketplace, um, something like eBay versus something like Walmart, like Walmart is one company selling a bunch of things to a bunch of people, where eBay is a bunch of people selling to each other. And so marketplaces are really valuable because they essentially have this wheel uh, where buyers transact with sellers and sellers transact with buyers and it spins. Uh, and it's extremely valuable because this wheel uh, is essentially a term for network effects. Uh, and the network effects in a marketplace are really valuable because uh, as it grows, it starts to get more valuable and it creates a moat. And so as your marketplace grows, sellers benefit from more buyers buyers benefit from more sellers, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so eBay was a classic example, but I'm gonna plug my own company in Grailed, uh, which is sort of a similar product in a niche, but essentially uh, we've gone in and we've identified a sort of like niche in men's streetwear, and we have a huge platform of both buyers and sellers where if you're trying to list anything in that field, uh, especially used goods, uh, that's really how we got started. Um, and to go back actually, the value of the moat uh, and some of these examples that I took is from this guy named Jeff Jordan. He's uh, Jeff Jordan is a partner over at Andreessen. He started uh, at e or he didn't start eBay, but he was at eBay really early on, and. He talks about how when he joined eBay, Amazon and Yahoo, who were these like giant companies, were also trying to compete in the marketplace world. But eBay itself already had such a large network effect where when a player like Amazon comes in and they say, hey, like free seller fees, they got a ton of people on one side, but because they didn't really have the buyer side of the network effect, uh, they failed to compete with eBay. And so you know, Amazon kind of just stuck to its core business model. And uh, that's sort of like where Grailed is today, although we're starting to see a lot of competition in even more specific niches. So a lot of new companies, if you know about the industries, are coming out uh, either in like the women's side of things or specifically in sneakers or specifically in collectibles. Uh, and they're starting to compete. And they're also offering different types of ways to differentiate, such as like being a managed marketplace, which um, I won't go too deeply into uh, unless we have extra time in the Q&A. 
Uh, another good example of this is Open Table, where uh, you know diners and restaurants are on the platform, and diners want to be on the platform because it's easy to book uh, with all of the same restaurants, and restaurants want to be where the diners are. Um, I know Resi is sort of up and coming in New York, but uh, other examples like in San Francisco, a lot of companies have tried to compete with Open Table, and they have also done so by bringing a lot of restaurants on the platform, and restaurants will use their platform for bookings, but no diners will show up. Uh, and so they always have to resort to going to open table uh, or having both. And so uh, to summarize kind of a couple of the basics of marketplaces, there's a lot of components, but really the four main ones is that it has strong network effects. The community does most of the work, uh, and that's sort of the many-to-many -many relationship. And because of that, there's really no physical constraints on growth, whereas a traditional one-to-many retailer has to hold inventory and there's a lot more operational costs as you scale up. Uh, and therefore, it's often very capital efficient, and that's why we see a lot of the big platforms today uh, are marketplaces uh, rather than traditional retailers. And, and a good example of sort of the value of this too is you see uh, companies today like Walmart as an example are actually starting to try to take on more of the marketplace uh, business model. So jumping into the consumer product side of things, usually we think about consumer products as B2C or C2C. And when we do so, uh, we focus on building these types of products uh, by solving a set of problems for a specific set of users. And generally speaking, this is like the right way to do this. I'm by no means saying this is not how uh, you're supposed to you know, be a PM. And a typical PM doc in this setting looks something like this, where you go about setting a goal, you identify some user problems, and you come up with a set of solutions, you prioritize, come up with a timeline, some risks and trade-offs, uh, and you go and execute, and you know, some variation of this type of stuff. Uh, but as products grow, and as things like monetization become increasingly important, we can start to think about consumer products as a multi-sided marketplace. And this is super valuable, uh, as I mentioned earlier, because it starts to help you think more holistically, and it really helps you balance the needs of different users of your product. Uh, so in a traditional marketplace, this is pretty straightforward. You got buyers and sellers. A lot of the times their needs actually flow really well together, but sometimes things conflict. For example, uh, price is often one where like sellers obviously want the highest price and buyers obviously want to pay the lowest price and you kind of have to think about how to balance that. Uh, and it's really straightforward with traditional marketplaces. Um, but a couple examples of non-traditional marketplaces, uh, and one specifically that kind of I have more experience with, um, the two here, obviously Facebook uh, and Instagram. Um, they're content platforms, and so you have a mix of advertisers, uh, consumers like you and us, or you and I, uh, and publishers, creators, so on and so forth. Uh, the same goes for YouTube. You have a lot of creators, um, less sort of like user-generated content, generally speaking, but like a lot of creators and publishers, a lot of consumers, and a lot of advertisers. Uh, and Spotify, which I won't talk as much about today, uh, unless we have extra time at the end, is also very interesting because um, you have a whole different set of artists on there uh, where you have like your big artists that you have to worry about and they draw a lot of consumers onto the platform, but then you have your small artists who are trying to become larger uh, on the platform, and, and then you have your advertisers or your like paid consumers. And so in a three-sided marketplace, uh, today focusing on content platforms as the main example, uh, we really have consumers, creators, and advertisers, uh, and they all have different needs that we'll talk about in a moment. Any, any questions so far? This all makes sense? Cool. So before we get any further, uh, the main thing I want to talk about today is marketplace liquidity. And the, the essential definition of this is that it's the efficiency in which a marketplace matches buyers and sellers on the platform. Uh, and liquidity is extremely important uh, because it basically is when supply meets demand. And this translates into sort of like the biggest aha moment on both sides of the marketplace. Uh, and if you guys don't know what aha moments is, just sort of like look up activation and user journeys. It's like a growth term for sort of like the moment that someone realizes value on your platform. Uh, and this is super important because uh, if you happen to manage your liquidity really well, then you have a marketplace or a product that flows seamlessly between both sides. Uh, and it means that when buyers come to the platform, they find what they want really quickly and they purchase something. And when sellers start listing things on the platform, their stuff gets sold really quickly and both sides are really satisfied. Uh, and on the topic of cars, I think Uber and how they ha handle their pricing is a really great way of thinking about someone who uh, is using pricing to navigate liquidity between drivers, uh, drivers and riders. And so before Uber, you know, we had 
uh, this traditional taxi model where oftentimes there might be a shortage between supply and demand uh, based off of pricing or based off of how many cars there were on the road uh, or whether or not you could get a car at any given moment. And what Uber did was they used um, a phone or a mobile app uh, to manage that a lot better. Uh, and so by either like raising the price or by increasing the demand and helping uh, the two parties match with one another, uh, they've managed to control that. Uh, and a greater example too is thinking about like when you're in surge, right, and the price uh, goes up further, um, usually it's because there's a shortage of supply that's not meeting the demand at the time. And although consumers aren't necessarily happy about paying more, they're willing to pay more. And that increased price brings the supply up and they're able to really optimize the liquidity on their platform. So why should you care about this? Um, unless you work on a marketplace, this doesn't really apply, um, although there are, again, a lot of marketplace products out there today. But in general, the concept of liquidity can be applied to product strategy in a way that helps you balance the needs and trade-offs of different users uh, really well. So how should you actually go about optimizing for liquidity? Um, there's a lot of different ways. Pricing is one of the ones that I mentioned, but some of the fundamental ones I'm going to talk about today is discoverability, trust, and scale. Uh, and so with discoverability, uh, the main thing here is that you improve on demand or the supply uh, and you help it meet each other. So the Uber, Uber example is really great where you kind of really just focus on helping people find rides uh, or you focus on drivers being able to actually match up with riders really quickly. Trust is extremely important because this is uh, essentially sort of like the piece of uh, the point in which like people actually are willing to use your product. Uh, and so you got to make sure that people feel confident transacting on your marketplace. Uh, and scale, lastly, uh, where we'll focus our, some of our discussion today is uh, how you actually go about growing the numbers of buyers and sellers to increase network effects and ultimately create a moat. And this is really important because sometimes uh, as your product starts to grow, it's much easier to grow one side than the other. So like when I was at Facebook, for example, there's a ton of advertiser demand, but we couldn't always grow the advertiser, or we can just let the advertisers come in and start purchasing everything up because we didn't have enough uh, ad load and supply to actually make that a good like return on investment for them. And so in a two-sided example, uh, pretty straightforward, uh, buyers, sellers, um, they need to trust. You want to have products that sort of match with the needs of both sides. So making sure that you're actually focused on like a good enough niche and you want to make sure that you're scaling both sides at an equal pace. For a content platform, uh, some of the main consumer needs that I've outlined today is one, uh, for consumers, they want to just come on and, and see interesting content. And they also dislike having too many ads. For creators, they want to grow their fan base and they want to make money. And then for advertisers, they want to reach their consumers uh, and also they want a good return on ad spend. And so how some of these concepts can apply to these users in a three-sided marketplace is uh, one, improving on demand to meet the supplier or vice versa. That's making sure that we're actually putting content onto the platform that people are interested in. So we're going out and getting creators uh, to make entertaining content such that consumers want to view that. In terms of trust, uh, there's actually a lot of metrics here. Um, the three main ones is like making sure that we have strong user sentiment, and this is really building for the long term. So at Facebook, we really cared about like not serving people too many ads, because if you do, then eventually they start using the product less and less uh, over time. And uh, ad performance is also really important because for advertisers, you really have like a small window for them to want to continue using your product. Uh, if they come on and it doesn't perform and it doesn't generate a good ROI, they're not gonna continue giving you money, uh, hoping that it works. And then lastly, for creator payouts, this is a way of essentially making sure that creators are incentivized to continue putting content on your platform. For, and for scale, uh, the last one is really important because uh, for us, we realize that this essentially is what allows us to grow the like supply for advertisers by really focusing on video consumption growth for creators and consumers uh, to increase ad opportunities without disrupting user sentiment or ad performance. Um, the more time and the more people are watching videos, the more we can advertise without putting too many ads on every single video, uh, so on and so forth. And so in this flywheel, we see with consumers, um, very specifically, uh, two of the user metrics that we looked at is just like video watch time and user sentiment. Uh, user sentiment was measured based off of a um, 
based off of like a quality or a quantitative survey where we essentially like polled users over time and it was like a Facebook cares about you sort of thing. Uh, and then video watch time, pretty straightforward, but it's like how much time per session are they spending consuming videos. For advertisers, we looked at two things. One was the actual performance of the ad and how well they converted. And so a lot, there was a lot of work that we did in making sure that when someone did see an ad uh, that we were serving it so that they clicked through and they made a purchase or they signed up or they followed, so on and so forth. Uh, and then we also wanted to make sure that uh, we balance the return on ad spend for advertisers. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, we can grow the number or the amount of money that we're making really easily, but without an increased supply, it means that this, a smaller group or a large group of advertisers are all gonna be bidding on the same slots. And therefore it's gonna raise the prices of conversion rates uh, and it's not gonna make it worthwhile for them to continue using this product. And then for content creators, uh, we looked at essentially uh, a definition of creator earnings called yield, which was defined as the number of dollars we pay out to them per like minute of video content uploaded or video content viewed. Um, so gold against other things such as like how quickly we can help new creators get onto the platform and grow, uh, as well as how well their content was discovered when they published, uh, so on and so forth. So that's mostly it. Um, if I were to summarize some of the key takeaways is one, uh, market dynamics can apply to products that aren't traditionally viewed as marketplaces. Two, liquidity is king. Uh, and you can think about liquidity in a lot of different ways of, to apply to different types of uh, consumer products. And three, some variation of discoverability, trust, and scale can really help you optimize for liquidity.